Yeah, so I was asked to talk about livestock and climate and here in particular about methane. <clears throat> and I just want to preface um, why, why is it that we talk about greenhouse gases? We talk about greenhouse gases not because they are generating um, carbon emissions. Uh, primarily, we're talking about greenhouse gases because they cause warming. And so the Paris Climate Accord, for example, <clears throat> which we are all following, the Paris Climate Accord has a warming goal and, uh, and that's really important to emphasize. It's not an emissions goal, but an, a warming goal of not getting us to add additional warming beyond one and a half to two degrees centigrade. And so we should adhere to that warming goal also in agriculture. And uh, I want to talk about uh, particularly methane because it really, really matters in us being able to adhere to that warming goal. When... Um, greenhouse gases are compared to one another, the most frequent so-called matrix that's being used is, so, is the, called, the so-called global warming potential, or GWP100. Uh, as Aaron just alluded to, uh, methane is a potent greenhouse gas, uh, 28 times more potent uh, when using this GWP100 matrix, nitrous oxide even more so. So um, I don't have a beef with that uh, at all, but um, there is more nuance to methane. And methane really is the Achilles heel of livestock and climate. And so we have to kind of unwrap that a little bit. So what's special about methane? When you look at the global methane budget, so all methane uh, sources in the world, you'll find that they amount to a total of 558 teragrams. And these are fossil fuel production, agricultural waste, and so on and so on. What is oftentimes left out of the discussion around methane is that there's an actual budget. Methane is not just produced, but as you can see on the right side, methane is also destroyed. There are sinks amounting to approximately 550 teragrams. In other words, 560 are produced globally and 550 are uh, destroyed. And, uh, and that leaves the balance, which is 10. Still a number we seek to reduce, but certainly one uh, that is different from just looking at sources. When you look at sinks, you see a large arrow pointing down. And underneath it says, sink from chemical reactions in the atmosphere. And what that is, that chemical reaction in the atmosphere, is a process by which a methane molecule meets another molecule called a hydroxyl radical, which destroys it. And that generally takes approximately a decade for that methane molecule to being destroyed. And this is a very important nuance, uh, one that we don't hear very often. The nuance that leads to a drastically different lifespan of these gases, uh, methane, as I just described, because it's not just produced, but also destroyed, has a lifespan of a little over a decade. And in contrast to that, carbon dioxide, one of a thousand years, nitrous oxide, another long-lived uh, climate pollutant, one of over a hundred years. You will see in a few minutes why this really matters, that methane has a short lifespan and how that affects its behavior in warming our planet. But before I talk about that, I, I briefly want to talk about the carbon in the methane, the C in the CH form, where it comes from and where it's going. It all starts with photosynthesis, the process by which plants that our animals eat, by which plants uh, need sunlight, uh, water, and a source of carbon. And that carbon, these plants suck out of the atmosphere in the form of CO2. The plants then convert that carbon into carbohydrates, such as cellulose or starch, Animals eat that plant material, and in the case of ruminants, they will belch out some methane, some more uh, will come from the manure. The belching is referred to as enteric emissions. So the question now is, is this carbon in the methane in the CH4, is this new and additional carbon added to the atmosphere, or is it recycled? And the answer I have is, this is not new and additional carbon added to the atmosphere. It's recycled carbon. It used to be in the atmosphere before in the form of CO2. It has changed its form from CO2 to methane, but it's not additional carbon. As long as the herd sizes of our livestock are stable, as long as they are stable, we are not adding additional new carbon to the atmosphere. Hence, a stable herd will not add additional warming because you don't add additional carbon, you're not adding additional warming. And that is a function of this gas not just being produced, but also being destroyed. A process that I already referred to as hydroxyl oxidation destroys methane and converts it back into CO2 and water. And then that CO2 goes back into the atmospheric pool from where our plants um, uh, withdraw uh, carbon again. 
So we have a biogenic carbon cycle on the livestock side, which is relatively short-lived, a little over a decade. The question then in a few minutes is, is that the same for other sources of greenhouse gases? But before I go there, really quickly, the question of where's our inventory for livestock, let's say for beef and dairy, where's that going? Where has it been going? On the beef side, we used to have 140 million beef cattle. Today, we have much fewer, only 90. But today, we produce the same amount of beef as we used to historically. So we have 50 million fewer beef cattle producing the same amount of beef as the original herd. On the, on the dairy side, a similar picture. We used to have 25 million dairy cows. Today, we have nine. We went from 25 to nine. But with this much smaller herd today, we are producing 60% more milk. That means the carbon footprint of a glass of milk has shrunk by two thirds. And here, a depiction of uh, the historic development for beef on top and dairy at the bottom. From 1867 until now, we see that originally, historically, beef inventories went up, up until the 1970s. That's when we peaked. And since then, they have gone down drastically from 140 to now 90 million. On the dairy side, back in 1867, we used to have 9 million dairy cows. At the height in the 1950s, we had 25, and now we are back down to 9, approximately. So the reason why I show you this is because methane has a short lifespan of less than 20 years, it's really important what happens historically to methane. As you can see, when the inventory is built up, we added new additional methane, and that caused new additional warming. For beef, that went up to the 1970s, for dairy, up to the 1950s. But since then, since then, since the heights, our inventories went down. And with it, the methane went down. It certainly didn't go up. And that addresses the question of whether or not our herd sizes and therefore our methane in the atmosphere is increasing or not from the livestock sector. On the fossil fuel sector, uh, which is by far the main culprit of greenhouse gases, and here particularly is CO2, the picture is different. Here you have oil, coal, and gas, pure carbon that was stored in the ground for a long time. What is oil, coal, and gas? It's nothing other than um, fossilized forests and animals such as dinosaurs that died, decayed, fossilized, accumulated underground for hundreds of millions of years. And over the last 70 years, 7-0, that is the humans, uh, human humanity extracted approximately half of all these uh, carbons from the ground. What do we do with it? We extracted it, we burned it and added new additional, new additional, and that's important, carbon to the atmosphere. And that's why our CO2 is going up, up, up and up. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is not a short-lived uh, cycle uh, as it is on the biogenic carbon cycle for cows, but it is a long uh, standing one-way street from the ground up into the atmosphere. On this slide, you see the direct contrast of fossil carbon being extracted and added to the atmosphere. Whereas on the biogenic side, you have CO2 that makes it into plants during photosynthesis. Some stays above, the majority goes below ground into roots, and from there into the soil, a process called soil carbon sequestration. Animals, of course, eat above ground vegetation in the process produce some methane, but as long as these methane emissions are constant over time, because the herd sizes are constant, then the amount of methane produced and the amount of methane destroyed are roughly in balance, roughly in balance. A constant cattle herd, a constant livestock herd does not add new additional, new additional carbon to the atmosphere, hence no new additional warming. And I'll uh, get to that in a minute. And then that methane is broken down again into CO2. So that's a very different scenario from this one-way street on the one to this relatively short-lived cycle on the other side. Because of the fact that methane is not just produced but also destroyed, uh, scientists had a B for a long time with this unit GWP100 because it seems to only really um, account as methane being a gas that's produced and it leaves out the fact that it's also destroyed. And as, as a result, uh, colleagues from Oxford University in the UK devised a new unit called GWP star. And that is based on the premise that the old unit GWP 100 that has been used for the last 30 years drastically overestimates the impact of a constant source of methane on warming because it does not account for the removal of this gas, at least not in the way that it really occurs. So these colleagues from Oxford had said for a long time that a constant source of methane, when described 
by GWP 100 over, is overestimating the impact of this gas by a factor of four. They developed this new unit made the GWP star that actually looks at the warming impact of methane and not just the production, but also the destruction of methane. What um, I find very interesting is that this top statement here, that GWP 100 overestimates methane's impact on warming from constant sources by a factor of four has found its way into the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, AR6 report last August, where it said, GWP, uh, where it says, by comparison, expressing methane emissions as CO2 equivalent emissions using GWP 100 overestimates or overstates the effect of constant methane emissions on global surface temperatures by a factor of three to four. So that is really important that what I just told you has found its way into the AR6 IPCC report. You will also see a lot of mentioning here of GWP star, the unit I just uh, alluded to, the unit from Oxford University. So why does that matter? Why is it a big deal? I will quickly explain the differences between a gas like CO2 versus methane and how they accumulate or not and how they uh, affect our warming. So imagine you were to live 20 uh, minutes away from, from, um, from home. On day one, on Monday, you drive your car to work, you put CO2 into the atmosphere. Um, on Tuesday, you drive again and you put new additional CO2 into the atmosphere, uh, addition to the existing stock from the previous day. On Wednesday, you drive again and you get the gist of it here. Every time you burn fossil fuels, you add new additional carbon to the existing stock from the day prior, the week prior, the month prior, and so on. Remember that gas has a lifespan of a thousand years, and that means it accumulates. It's a cumulative stock gas. Currently, methane is treated as if it were a stock gas too, as if every time our livestock belches or produces uh, methane from the manure, as if that were to accumulate. It leaves out the fact that methane is not just produced, but also destroyed. This whole process of hydroxyl oxidation does not find its way appropriately uh, represented in it. And because of that, methane is not a stock gas. Methane is a flow gas. A constant source of methane does not add additional warming to our planet. That's really important. That, doesn't that does not mean that methane is not a problem. It is, and I will show you in a minute why. But it's important to highlight that methane is a different gas compared to CO2, not just with respect to its potency, but also in respect to how it warms the planet. I'll give you three scenarios here. The first one is one where over 30 years, methane increases by 35%. The second one is one where methane is held relatively stable. And the third one where methane has decreased over 30 years. How are these three scenarios depicted using this old unit GWP 100? Well, GWP 100 doesn't really characterize the warming, but it characterizes how these different scenarios um, relate to CO2 equivalent units. And in all three scenarios, GWP star predicts a lot of additional CO2 equivalent emissions. This new unit GWP star differs. Yes, when you increase methane, something bad happens, which is additional warming, which is the blue north of the x-axis. So. That's where GWP star and GWP 100 align. But if you either hold stable or slightly reduce methane, then you won't see any blue north of the x-axis. In fact, because there's a slight reduction, you see a little bit blue taken out, meaning warm heat taken out of the atmosphere. This is called negative warming that occurs when you have a slight reduction of methane. When you have a strong reduction of methane, you see a lot of negative warming. Uh, those colleagues from Oxford called it cooling. I, I call it negative warming. But what it means is you're pulling a lot of carbon from the atmosphere when you reduce methane. And that makes methane an important part of a solution in our climate uh, uh, scenarios. So uh, one more depiction here that I also find very interesting and important, and that's this one. It shows uh, on top here uh, emissions of a CO2 source and a methane source. Let's say a power plant. Uh, over 30 years emits increasing amounts of CO2 as a result of producing more and more and more power. When the CO2 emissions of that power plant increase, so does the warming, but the warming increases exponentially because CO2 is an accumulative, accumulative stock gas. If you, let's say, have a feedlot with, with 10,000 cattle and increase the herd to 15,000, then that would increase methane over time. That increasing methane would lead to increasing and linearly increasing uh, warming related to that methane. If you now hold the power plant uh, power production stable, you will also have stable CO2. 
but the related warming will not be stable, it will be increasing because CO2 accumulates in the atmosphere. On the other side, if you have, let's say, a stable feedlot with 10,000 cattle 20 years ago, and it's still 10,000, then that stable constant methane source will not lead to additional warming, but to constant warming. No additional warming from stable sources. That's what I just explained earlier. But now comes what's really exciting. What happens when you decrease CO2 and you decrease methane? When you decrease CO2, for example, that power plant, uh, you decrease its load and eventually you shut it down, then the related warming still goes up all the way up until the point that you shut that power plant, plant down and then the related warming will plateau. That's what it takes to affect warming from reducing CO2. You have to shut it down. That's why the world talks about net zero carbon. But look what happens when you reduce methane. When you reduce methane, you have an instantaneous impact on warming namely a negative one. And that means if we find ways to reduce methane from manure, from enteric sources and so on, we can reduce warming. And that makes us part of a potential solution. So we don't want to increase it over time. We don't want to increase hertz. We don't want to increase methane. We want to either hold it stable or we want to reduce it, preferably. Can that be done? So this scenario here of reducing methane strongly by 35%, and inducing a strong negative warming impact, i.e. cooling impact. Can that be done? And the answer is yes, it can. Here in California, we have a new law that mandates a 40% reduction of methane. And many of our dairies went ahead and they covered their lagoons. And you see it here, the, the lagoon covers are bulging out and underneath it, tra it traps the biogas. And instead of um, um, just burning the biogas, this biogas is now taken, cleaned up and used as vehicle fuel, a pathway called dairy biogas to RNG, renewable natural gas. That's what it looks like when dairy RNG is then making its way into semi-trucks, fueling those and replacing diesel. This pathway of, of biogas to RNG is considered by the state of California as the most carbon negative pathway there is, and that's a really good thing, uh, leading to very, high, to very high credits called low carbon fuel standard credits. These credits can amount to half the amount per cow, half the amount, half the dollar amount of what a dairy makes uh, from selling milk. So how um, prevalent is this technology? It is prevalent. We have, uh, we've seen a lot of these uh, covered lagoons going in and that has led to 25% reduction of California dairies uh, methane emissions over the last few years. We will achieve the 40%, I have no doubt, and our dairy industry is, is on it, working together with the state to put those units in and capturing biogas. We've done a lot of research here at UC Davis on, uh, on feed additives. We've studied about 30 across um, several labs, uh, Hermes Cabrera and my lab in particular. And we have found that most of these feed additives don't work, but those that do have a significant impact on reducing enteric methane. So uh, I leave some of that discussion for question and answers, but there's hope that we will have um, a meaningful way of reducing enteric emissions from, uh, from cattle. Um, in, my, in my opinion, methane is just a very interesting gas. It is oftentimes not understood. In my opinion, it is more of an opportunity than a liability. In my opinion, uh, we have ways to meaningfully cut it. And when we do, we benefit from it. I see dairies today, one of them is depicted here, uh, that have solar panels, large areas of solar panels that have anaerobic digesters, that feed additives and so on, that make a meaningful uh, contribution to us and our impact on climate. And so I'm kind, of, I'm, I'm kind of bullish in understanding methane and other greenhouse gases better, reducing them aggressively and making agriculture part of a climate solution. With that, just really briefly, uh, we published a, a, a white paper not too long ago. You see, it, you see the title here, you find it on the internet, uh, as well as a YouTube video on methane that summarizes what I just said, but in only five minutes. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to the discussion later. Yeah, we have a question uh, in the Zoom. The question to Frank, um, uh, the question is, you talked about the decreases for beef and the dairy inventory but uh, what about the swine and poultry uh, methane production and trends? And if he's able to comment on that. Yeah, that's a good question. I do not have the numbers uh, available. I'm sorry about that. Um, my, my focus is really more on the ruminants because they are so much uh, more of a source. But um, um, 
the inventory number should be easy to come by. I just uh, didn't have, didn't have the chance uh, for for pigs and for poultry. But the the methane would uh, would track those those numbers pretty well. 